Mao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Krishna Kutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shwami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Bhagavani Pacharni, Nirvashe Shunya Vari Pushachari Satagani, Mao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Krishna Kutale, Srimati Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Namane, Sri Varshamana Vidhi 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 Namaste Gurbani Shimutai in Italian Rupu, the Guru Hapa Sidhan, the Dwan, the Harini, the Mokori Kishoraya Shok Shok by Rabbi Mutai, the Sampo, the Param Mujai Tina, the Mokhatilodaya Satchitan, and the Namago, the Shakti Swan by Rupu, the variety of the Pahu who may come, near release the Shat Jana, the Avish, the Sarabhoma Shijak and Tai Tina Mahaman, Chakal Patu, Mr. Creep, the Sindhu Yavacha, Patitan and Pavari, the Vaish, the Baby, the Mona. Namo Mahavadhyaya Krishna Prima Parayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gauri Vishnama Pancha Tattvama Kam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Srupa Kam Bhaktiya Avatara Bhaktiya Kyam Namani Bhakti Shakti Kam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Jina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesh Gopita Kandara Rekanta Namo Sute Jaya Dham Sura Tur Pam Gaur Mama Mandir Matevar Kati Matsa Vasha Param Bojo Shri Rarvana Mohana Uri Vyad Vrindara Nika Patru Madakshi Matrut Naga Shinhasha Stoho Shri Shri Vara Shri Lago Vindeva Prashtala Vise Dumanus Marami Shri Mangla Sarasaram Vivaan Shiva Tata Tasta Takarshan Vinu Svarayur Gopi Ir Gopi Nata Shri Tata Tata Kanchana Gaurangi Vara Hevindavani Shri Prishya Vara Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Karata Hara Shri Vara Sri Gaur Vakapitra Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, we should offer our respectful obeisances under the personality of Godhead, Lord Narayan, unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author. <coughs> so this morning we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 18, text number 26, which is on the board. Kindly repeat this verse after me, watch your line. Antar Bhagavatam. Darumaim, Darumaim, made of wood, made of wood. Nara, Nara, a man, a man. Striyam, Striyam, a doll, a doll. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Sri Bhakti Ramana Swami, Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. My dear Lord, just as a puppeteer controls his dancing dolls and a husband controls his wife, Your Lordship controls all the living entities in the universe, such as the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. Although you are in everyone's heart as a supreme witness and commander, and are outside everyone as well, the so-called leaders of societies, communities, and countries cannot realize you. Only those who hear the vibration of the Vedic mantras can appreciate you. The fourth, the Supreme Personality of God, it is Antarabhahi, present within and without everything. One must overcome the delusion caused by the Lord's external energy and realize His presence both externally and internally. In the Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 8, 19, Srimati Kunti Devi has explained that Krishna appears in this world nato natyap dharu yata exactly like an actor dressed as a player. In Bhagavad Gita 1861, Krishna says Ishwara Sarva Dev Shet Arjuna Krishna the Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna. The Lord is situated within everyone's heart and outside as well. Within the heart, He is the Super Soul, the Incarnation who acts as the advisor and witness. Yet although God is residing within their hearts, foolish people say, I cannot see God, please show Him to me. <coughs> so I just comment on this first paragraph. There's two more paragraphs. Um, so Shri Prabhupada concludes this paragraph by saying that foolish people say, I cannot see God, please show him to me. So not only can they not see God, 
First of all, they cannot even see their own selves. There's a, uh, you see this word in the second line, Abhrishta Rupa. So uh, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, in uh, an explanation of the uh, evidence, it is an explanation of, of logical evidence for the existence of the soul, for the fact that we are not these bodies. The person is not the material body, but actually the person is a spiritual being. So in that verse, there's also a very similar word, actually the same word, adrishta shrutta. Uh, adrishta means the soul cannot be seen. Drishta, drishti means vision or power to see something. So when something is adrishta, it's beyond our power of vision. And adrishta shruti means also not only you cannot see it, but you cannot hear it. Shruta means to hear. So, atta uh, para uh, of uh, this verse says that uh, the real person he is para he is uh, beyond or para also it means transcendental of yakta para of yakta beyond uh, the unmanifest realm now we are in this uh, let's say dimension we use a pseudo scientific word dimension of of manifest material energy. So we are seeing, hearing, perceiving with our senses, only matter. So if one, uh, by power of meditation or speculation, goes beyond sense perception, this gross sense perception, he enters a realm called a vyakta. Vyakta means unmanifest. And that may be uh, the realm of pradhan, uh, which is unmanifest material energy, which Shukadeva Goswami says uh, one can only understand he uses the term Shunyavat just like we say the Buddhist philosophy is Shunyavada so Shunyavat, it is just void a void condition or beyond that if one is more adept in uh, subtle perceptions and meditation one may enter the impersonal Brahma and that is also a Vyakta there is nothing there to be seen or felt or heard is simply light, um, pure white light, spiritual energy. So, a tokpara of yakta, the the person, this the actual person, the spiritual person within the heart, uh, his uh, existence can only be perceived beyond that of yakta. And so, it is a drishti shuti. Huh? Drishta Shruti means he cannot be seen and cannot be heard of Yudha, Guna Brimitam. His existence is beyond the influence of the modes of nature. What we are now, what we know ourselves to be now, is simply a product of the combination of the three modes of material nature. Our physical form, our mental uh, makeup, our intellect, even our false ego. Everything that we think we are, that we hold our, you know, so dear, someone insults us or someone wants to engage us in some way and we say, you don't understand me. But what is this understanding? What does this mean? It is just an illusion of mind. So, uh, Bhagavatam says very clearly uh, uh, that Abhyutta Guna Brimita, that person that you are is beyond the modes. He cannot be seen. And yet, Vishnu Shruti Vastuva. The word Vastuva means something is there. <laughs> Don't think that the conclusion is, well, then I'm nothing. If I can't be seen, if I can't be heard, if it's even beyond objective, then what can be there? No, Vastu. Vastu means reality or substance, real substance. So, Vishnu Shruti Vastuva. There is something there uh, uh, of a higher or highest reality. But right now we cannot see, we cannot hear it. But how, so then how, how can we know that we do exist beyond not only material world, but even beyond the unmanifested realm? So, sajivo yat punar Because there is an eternal person there. Therefore, the jiva, the living entity, whom we understand in this material world uh, through 
grow senses and mind, we understand that there are living beings here, although we cannot actually see them in their true form. But we can know that the jivas uh, in, are there in their true form because there is repeated birth and death. If there was, uh, if we were only matter, then why would there be continuity? This is a very profound point. Just like, uh, as an example, uh, there is a uh, mango farmer, and he <coughs> has planted in his land mango seeds. And these seeds have grown up into trees. And now he has a nice grove of mango trees. Now one night a thief steals into the mango grove with a big sack. And he fills it up with mangoes. And then he goes trotting off somewhere, but he gets caught. Uh, gets caught maybe trying to sell the mangoes later. So then uh, police arrest him and there's investigation. So the... Uh, uh, the mango seller is there, or I'm uh, sorry, the mango uh, grower, he's there being interviewed and the thief is there. And so the mango grower says, this, this man, he stole my mangoes. He's been coming again and again in the night and stealing mangoes. And I want him punished. And then the mango thief replies as his defense that he has no, this man has no claim over these he could not make a legal claim because all he did was put seeds in the ground. He could have claim on the original seeds, but those seeds grew up into trees, and those trees bore fruit, and I stole the fruit of the trees. What does that have to do with him? Well, this sounds like a very intelligent argument, but I'm assure you in a court of law it will not be accepted. <laughs> because there is principle of continuity in everything. Uh, so uh, it is understood by everyone that uh, the seed grows into the tree and there is a continuity. It is actually the same entity. The same entity was once a seed, now is a tree and gives uh, uh, fruit. So in the same way, uh, the external form of the living entity, life after life, may change very radically. One life is a He's a human being, the next life he's a mongoose or an aardvark or something like that. Uh, so that's a very, very radical change. The modes of nature have changed his, his uh, self-conceptions, his mentality, his physical form completely. But continuity can still be traced out, just like continuity. What, what is an apparent relationship, at least if you examine with this drishti, with this vision we have, what is the relationship between a seed and a tree bearing fruit? Huh? Who can see the connection? Just by looking with these eyes. But by a more, by intelligence, by logic we can understand this connection. So similarly, Bhagavatam says, there must be a subtle person because there is repeated birth and death. Huh? So now, uh, it is said here that uh, people are questioning, I cannot see God, please show him to me. Well, you cannot even see yourself. Prabhupada said, uh, that very nice example, uh, you cannot even remember yourself as having been in the womb of your mother. Uh, even if they will say, I don't, I'm not sure if reincarnation or transmigration is a fact. Well, at least we can give this example. You don't remember that you were within the womb of your mother. But were you there? Yes, by logic and reasoning, you must admit you were there. So you cannot remember, you cannot see that now. But you must admit that you were there. Similarly, if, uh, from, even from this example we can understand there's continuity, there must be a subtle being behind this changing form of matter. Uh, so now, we are not aware of ourselves uh, as we are. We are certainly not in control of these material elements as they are forming and reforming these material bodies we get. We know definitely that we not, did not ask for this body. Uh, everybody, when they look in the mirror, they're dissatisfied. That's universal <laughs> experience. We always wish that we had been given another color eyes or hair or a smaller nose or whatever. 
So, uh, we're not in control of this. So then who is? You see, this is the next question. There's certainly a plan. If there's continuity, then there's certainly a plan. If there's karma, which uh, gives us our just desserts from uh, one life to the next, then who is behind that? All this is subject matter for a person whose brain works properly. Uh, a person who has good intelligence will delve into these matters. And the answer is given here. Saishwaras Tvam. You, Supreme Lord, are He, Saha. Uh, the Ishwar, the controller. Ishwara Sarvabhutnam Pradeshi Arjuna Tishtasi. The Supreme Lord, Ishwara, is situated within the hearts of all living beings. He is seated next to that true divinity, <coughs> that spiritual being in the heart. Krishna sees uh, that uh, true form of ourselves eternally. And because Krishna sees us as we are, Krishna loves us so much. This is actually a very wonderful point. We become disgusted with ourselves in this material world, as I said, look in the mirror, ugh. And then when we, whenever we try to do anything, we always make so many mistakes, and we be, ugh, I'm so stupid. And other people come and tell us, ugh, <laughs> you're so useless. <laughs> so we can become so depressed in this, except for a few brief moments sometimes, we become jacked up on the false ego, you see? False ego fix. <laughs> and then we crash down again in depression. Generally, the material existence means depression. But Krishna, then if we're so bad, if we're so nasty, why does Krishna remain in the heart? Even when we fall down, we become uh, mongooses or, or lobsters or crabs or things like that, very nasty ugly creatures that no one wants to have anything to do with. <laughs> if you see some scorpion or some big tarantula, you shrink away and cry, ah, horrible. But we should know that we were also in these forms and we can go in these forms again. But Krishna is always with us. Even if we fall down in the most nasty condition. Because Krishna is seeing us. Krishna, of course, he has this drishti, Amganiya Syasa Kalindriya Priti Mati Pashanti Panti Kalyanti Chiran Jagati. By his vision, by his drishti, he is producing, maintaining, and annihilating all the universes. It is said by uh, Raghava Goswami in uh, a very nice book he has written uh, that uh, the universes are being generated and maintained and destroyed by the Lord's Jnana Shakti, the power of vision. Everything is happening in the sight of the Lord. It's like it says in Upanishad, Sa'ikshita. The Lord sees, He looks, He glances, and then this material existence comes into being from His glance. So time factor springs from the glance, from the drishti of Krishna, and sets everything into motion, and maintains it, and destroys it. And then it is recreated again. So Krishna has the drishti, to see us as we actually are. And as we actually are, we are most beautiful in the sight of Krishna. Krishna wants our love. Krishna is thinking this living entity is so nice. And because actually, it is said in the Bible, for instance, man is created in the image of God. But that's a very distant, reflected, and perverted image. The real thing is the soul. That's the real person. And like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the spirit soul is actually an expansion, a direct expansion of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Minute, but nonetheless, all the wonderful qualities of Godhead are there in very small form. So the, for one who has spiritual vision, and Krishna is the first among those who have spiritual vision. From him, spiritual vision emanates and is shared by everyone else who has spiritual vision. So for one who has spiritual vision, the soul is most beautiful to look upon. So Krishna is seeing us in the heart and He's there uh, giving us intelligence, giving us the intelligence by which we can come to Him 
if we want to. But as Prabhupada says, see Krishna is in the heart and he's always transmitting uh, the message, love me, love God. And we are distorting this message into love dogs. The impetus to love is coming from super soul. But we pervert it. We aim it, we, we refocus it on gross material elements. And thus we become entangled. So the point I was making is what to speak of not being able to see God in the heart, we can't even see ourselves. If we could see ourselves as we really are, uh, then we would understand. We have no other purpose except to serve and love Krishna. So continuing the purport, to Prabhupada writes, Everyone is under the control of the Supreme Personality of God, exactly like dancing dolls controlled by a puppeteer or a woman controlled by her husband. A woman is compared to a doll, Daru Mai, because she has no independence. She should always be controlled by a man. Still, due to false prestige, a class of women wants to remain independent. What to speak of women, all living entities are prakriti, female, and therefore dependent on the Supreme Lord, as Krishna himself explains in Bhagavad Gita, Pariyam, the living entity is never independent. Under all circumstances, he is dependent on the mercy of the Lord. The Lord creates the social divisions of human society, brahmanas, chatriyas, vaishyas, and shudras, and ordains that they follow rules and regulations suited to their particular position. In this way, all members of society remain always under the Supreme Lord's control. Still, some people foolishly deny the existence of God. So, again, speaking in terms of logic and reason, it can be easily established. It has been established even in the history of uh, European philosophy by, by philosophers uh, as far back as the Greeks, uh, the Middle East, uh, Middle Age, Christian scholastic philosophers, Thomas <coughs> Aquinas and so on. Many, many philosophers up to the modern time have established by uh, logic and reason that uh, there is, there must be a supreme control. There must be an intelligent source to everything. <coughs> they have established that we are, we are dependent. We are under control. That is our experience. Uh, of course, there are other philosophers who are actually deluded. Uh, they are trying to foment society, woman means agitate, a spirit of atheism and independence, yes, but this is all false. So their logic is very, uh, very weak actually, but they may be good in juggling words. And uh, so they create a sort of, uh, in Kali Yuga, they're given facility by the personality of Kali to create a steady drumbeat of propaganda. Uh, and in this way, infect people's minds with doubt, because people are very prone to sense gratification in this age. And sense gratification, the facility becomes uh, very widespread, very easy for everyone to uh, break the regulatory principles and not even feel guilty about it, and feel that this is just the natural way of life. And so by doing this, uh, the, intelligent, the intelligence becomes reduced. Uh, we become more and more absorbed in bodily conception. And thus, uh, due to this ignorance, uh, we fall easy prey to these uh, uh, very uh, poor excuses for philosophers in the modern time. We're just making propaganda, not really on any logical basis. Uh, but they're just making a steady drumbeat of propaganda. There is no God, you are God. Just like uh, there was one pundit, Bhagavan Pandit, and uh, he was much beloved by the king because he was very, very intelligent. So uh, the king, although Bhagavan Pandit was not really part of the royal court, the king had his own ministers, his own pundits were his ministers. Uh, but Bhagavan Pandit was always being invited by the king to come and uh, talk with him, tell him stories, give him instruction. King just very much liked to hear from this pundit. So practically every day the pundit was coming and when he would come, whatever was going on, the king would stop, he would send the ministers away, all right, all right, let's break himself down. Come in, Bhagavan, sit down here, tell me something. You see, and, and all the ministers became envious. 
that the king actually, he likes this pundit who's an outsider much more than he likes us. So they decided to make a conspiracy uh, so that the pundit could never enter the king's presence again. So they told the palace guards that the king does not want Bhagavan Pandit to come in his palace again. So the guards, uh, who just obey orders without thinking, they said, yes, very good. So when Bhagavan Pandit came, then the, the guards on either side of the door with their spears, they put the spears together. You cannot enter. And he was trying to talk to them, but I always come here. The king always wants me to come. No, no, we have received order. You cannot enter. So then Bhagavan Pandit, he was loitering out in the garden. And every day he was coming, because he was suspecting some conspiracy, he was thinking. He, he understood that these pundits, uh, other the, uh, uh, ministers, were uh, envious. He thought maybe they have made some, some uh, conspiracy against him. So he would just wait in the garden, because he knows uh, the king will come out on a, on a walk uh, one of these days, and then I can see him. So uh, the, then the uh, king, he noticed that Bhagavan Pandit hasn't come today. So he was unhappy. And he said, where's Bhagavan Pandit? And the minister said, well, we're very sorry, Your Majesty. We didn't want to break this news to you, but since you're asking, Bhagavan, uh, Bhagavan Pandit has died. And then they produced a fake medical certificate from the royal physician. They got him in the conspiracy too. And he said he's died of such and such disease. So the king was very unhappy, very morose for a couple of days. And then one day he decided to go out and get some air. So he left his palace. So Bhagavan Pandit was in the garden. <coughs> saw the king coming out. So he thought, oh, here's my chance. But all the ministers were with, with the king. So when the ministers uh, saw Bhagavan Pandit coming, they made a tight knot, a crowd around the king. So the king couldn't see Bhagavan Pandit. He was trying to enter this way, <laughs> but the ministers kept putting their shoulders together, <laughs> and he couldn't get in between them. So the king didn't know he was there. So finally, Bhagavan Pandit he climbed a tree, and from the tree he was shouting, "Oh, my dear king, here is your loyal Bhagavan Pandit. Here I am. Here I am." And the ministers they immediately they went, "Ah! Oh no!" And then they turned to the king, "Your Majesty." We have to leave this garden immediately. Just see, that is the ghost of Bhagavan Pandit. <laughs> and then the king thought, oh, no, oh, this is inauspicious. All right, let us go in the palace immediately. <coughs> he turned around and went in the palace, and Bhagavan Pandit concluded, oh, I suppose the king really doesn't want to see me. Because although I have shown myself to him, he has turned and walked away. And so he left that country and never returned again. So, but this was all the result of some conspiracy on the part of these clever ministers. They convinced the king that this was not Bhagavan Pandit in the flesh, but it was a ghost. So, uh, in the same way, uh, clever demons, foolish, spiritually foolish, but materially clever demons who have assumed positions of uh, leadership, influence in society, they're doing like that. They made a conspiracy. You know, just like nowadays, if a politician, if a politician uh, would happen to say in the media, in television, that he's a firm believer in God, and I'm talking about practically anywhere in the world, maybe, maybe not India, but even in India, the politicians. Actually, I can speak on one interview. Yeah, that will be interesting. I'll mention this in a moment. Um, there are many. Uh, yes. Uh, Politicians, uh, they will not make any mention of God in their speeches. Because if they do, then they're immediately considered weird. Because of this ghostly propaganda that has been uh, spread throughout society. See, speaking about God is like seeing a ghost. You, know, you might as well come on TV, politician, and say, Last night I saw a ghost in my room. <laughs> and people will think, this guy. Well, I'm going to vote for him. <laughs> or he might say, uh, last week I was taken up in a flying saucer and the entities examined me. <laughs> you would never win an election if you said like that. 
And now it's come to the level that he says, I believe in God. Huh? I believe that uh, we're all parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. And our only mission in life is to serve him. People will say, uh-oh. This guy is a crackpot. <laughs> he won't get our vote. This is all the result of ghost and propaganda. And even in India, uh, I read an interview uh, by one uh, Bal Thakare, I think his name is. He's uh, the leader of uh, the Shiv Sain movement, Shiv Sain political party, which is supposedly militant Hindu movement. They're saying, you know, they're always preaching Muslims have become too strong in India, and we want to get back to the Hinduism and to the Vedas, and it seems superficially that oh, this is a very nice trend in Indian society. And uh, but then the reporter was asking him. I didn't ask him. You know, so this is another. If he was a devotee, he might say yes. Sometimes when I'm thinking of Krishna. <laughs> but what he said was, well, look, when my wife cuts onions in the kitchen, then I cry. <laughs> So, <laughs> this character is supposed to be, you know, some, I mean, people take him as a sort of uh, religious figure or a defender of religion. And that's on the interview, we could see he's a completely mundane person with no apparent, <coughs> apparent interest in God whatsoever. And all these answers, you know, they're sort of funny quips. When I only cry when my wife cuts on you, so on and so forth. This is just, again, to make people laugh and think, oh, he's a nice guy, he's normal like me. I'll vote for him. He eats onions. <laughs> he's not a fanatic. So we'll continue. Last paragraph. Self-realization means to understand one's subordinate position in relation to the Lord. When one is thus enlightened, he surrenders to the Supreme Personality of God and is liberated from the clutches of material energy. In other words, unless one surrenders to the lotus feet of the Lord, the material energy in its many varieties will continue to control him. No one in the material world can deny that he is under control. The Supreme Lord Narayan, who is beyond this material existence, controls everyone. The following Vedic mantra confirms this point, Eko ha vai Narayana asi. Foolish persons think Narayana to be on the platform of ordinary material existence. Because they do not realize the natural constitutional position of the living entity, they concoct names like Garudra Narayan, Swami Narayan, or Mitya Narayan. However, Narayan is actually the supreme controller of everyone. This understanding is self-realization. So, uh, to know Krishna, to know God, one must be in a position to receive the mercy of Krishna. So that means one has to be free of material bondage. Yesham Tvanta Gatam Papa Jananam Punya Karanam Te Dvanta Mohanya Mokta Yeba Janji Dhritta Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that to uh, be fixed in bhajan or fixed in devotional service uh, beyond the influence of material energy one has to be, number one, free of all sinful reactions. Number two, have a vast stock of, of uh, pious activities, but not materially pious activities, which are called uh, uh, karma muki, and then there's jnana muki. These are pious activities which nurture karma or jnana. But there's uh, bhakti, uh, bhakti muki kind of pious activities like watering Tulasi Devi, visiting uh, Holy Tom, Mayapur, Vrindavan, uh, engaging in service to the deity, serving the lotus feet of pure devotee, chanting the holy name of the Lord, taking Maha Prasada. So one has to have amassed uh, great heaps of this sort of piety. And then Krishna says, Te dvanga one has to be free from duality. One has to be, not be seeing this material world in terms of sense gratification, which means some aspects of the material world we like because it will uh, uh, 
afford a sense gratification. And other aspects of material existence we avoid because it is uh, opposed to our sense gratification. So this is duality. When one is plunged in this duality, then he falls into an e endless network of uh, confusion and delusion and problems, trying to struggle, trying to struggle to set this duality right. Anyway, so what Krishna is saying is, is that one has to be free from material contact. So, uh, uh, Shiva Prabhupada uses the term material bondage. Now it's interesting. But one is bound to this material nature by his desire. Uh, we have fallen into this material cage because of our desire. Dr. Notakura compares the material existence to a cage for trapping animals. Uh, you can trap uh, birds. Uh, I remember my friends used to, I had one friend who used to raise pigeons. He used to like to keep pigeons in a cage and he would catch pigeons by placing a cardboard box on a stick with a string tied to it and then he would put corn there. So the foolish pigeons would come and eat the corn and they would follow the corn underneath the cardboard box which was tipped up. As soon as they got underneath, from a distance he would pull the string and the box would drop and then he'd have his next pigeon. He would catch it and put it in the cage. So, but you know, Thakur has explained in one song uh, our uh, imprisonment in this Maya Pache, he calls it, which means the cage of Maya. Uh, in the same way that this cage was baited with sense gratification, and therefore we have come it, by our desire, willingly, like these foolish birds, we entered that cage and then the door snapped shut. And we've been trapped for uncountable births since that time. So, to receive uh, the mercy of Krishna, the true mercy of Krishna, by which you can understand Krishna as the supreme, beloved, the only lovable, worshipable object, uh, prana the Lord of our lives, uh, and uh, we can dedicate ourselves to Him completely. Uh, with full determination, with no uh, distraction from anywhere. That, so, to receive that mercy, one has to change his desire. One has to let go of, his, uh, of the embrace of material nature. Uh, just like there was uh, there's a story of one beggar who was very thin and hungry and sickly. So he was standing outside of a temple, a big temple. And because he was so weak, he was supporting himself by embracing a pillar on the outside. He had his arms around the pillar like this. And he was hanging so weak. So one rich man was on his way to the temple and saw this poor beggar in ragged clothes, so weak and decrepit, and almost falling on his face. He weren't clinging to that pillar. So they, poor, the rich man thought, well, let me show some compassion. So he bought uh, some Mahaprasad outside the temple. They had a stall selling Mahaprasad. So he bought Mahaprasad. And he came to the poor man and he wanted to place it in his hands. Please take this. So the poor man is clinging to the pillar and didn't want to let go. So then the poor man, he just held out his hands like this from around the pillar. And the rich man put the Mahaprasadam there. And the rich man stood back to watch. What is he going to do now? And so the poor man was trying to <laughs> stretch his neck around the side of the pillar to eat the Mahaprasad. But of course, he couldn't do it. His neck doesn't stretch that far. <laughs> so the rich man thought, hmm. And for no purpose at all, I have bought this Mahaprasad because this man is so foolish. <laughs> Although I put it right into his hand because he won't let go of that pillar. He cannot take it. So he just went into the temple, leaving him <laughs> struggling. <laughs> so this story is told to illustrate the conditioned soul 
who is very firmly embracing the pillar of Maya. So when even the pure devotee or Krishna himself comes to give his mercy, his real mercy, such persons are unable to take, even if it's put right in their hand. And they take some ridiculous <laughs> uh, uh, method to try and get, you know, enjoy that mercy. That means the method they take is elevationism or salvationism. They try to exploit the mercy of the Lord for these two purposes. Elevationism means, uh, they think mercy means to become materially elevated. In this life, to become rich and fat and happy, uh, enjoying sense gratification like anything, and then in the next life going to heaven and enjoying there. So to become elevated material, this is what they think. Or salvation, that means uh, after climbing up this mountain of elevation, which I, well, actually what does it mean? It means worshiping God or accepting the mercy of God with a view to become a Christian. This is, this is why they cannot actually take, you know, they're like that foolish man who can't eat the Mahaprabhu. Because the mercy is, you become my servant. Krishna comes and says, now I grant you uh, the power and authority to be my servant. Come on. He's invited. He's displaying his lila. Uh, his devotees are there, ecstatic uh, transcendentalists uh, who are always displaying such wonderful emotions of love of Godhead. Their association is so purifying and they're inviting these wonderful Vaishnavas, the conditioned souls, come on, here there's a place free in Krishna's service. You come on, come on and take your place. Here's some ecstatic service we're just rendering. Here, come on, take, make this garland, pick these flowers. Do this RT, distribute these books, do something, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and Krishna is there. Yes, I will accept your service. You can also become my intimate servant. But they want to become Krishna. <laughs> Therefore, they're like that man trying to stretch him. <laughs> There's the mercy right in the hand. And then they're thinking, well, this is God's mercy then. Let me use it to become Krishna. And that's impossible. So I, I pointed this out. You see, I've seen religions around the world. They like to worship some avatar or some acharya who shows himself to be most austere, sense controlled. Uh, like in the West, Jesus Christ, he's always depicted hanging on the cross with a thorn of crowns, leaving here from the Roman spear. And he's he's no. But he's, he arose from the dead, so he's very, very powerful to endure such suffering for our sins, and then three days later arise from the dead. So he's certainly powerful. Or I've seen the Hindus who worship Lord Shiva. They offer him uh, shoes with nails driven up from the bottom. And here, my dear Lord, wear these shoes. And this way you prove to us that you're powerful. Just like Jesus proved that he's powerful by hanging on the cross with nails in his hands and feet. Well, that we can believe. Well, if he can do things like that, then he must be he must be the one who's qualified to give us what we want. So they like to see the Acharya or the Avatar whom they worship, very austere, <laughs> with nails in the feet. You see, like Lord Shiva sitting on ice, meditating. And what do they want from him? He's got power. And what do they want from him? Ah, let me dance with my girlfriends under the shining full moon. Huh? Let me play up my musical instrument and attract all the young girls. Maybe not flute, maybe guitar. But anyway. <laughs> you study their psychology. They just want to be Christian. And they worship uh, Krishna's representative, you know, the avatar, for that purpose. So, it's like climbing a mountain. You're going through so many uh, rituals, uh, troublesome rituals, uh, performing austerity, so on and so forth. Like climbing a mountain, hoping that at the top, then I will become God. But before they get to the top, they fall off. 
they slip and they fall inevitably. This is the karma kamiya process. You can go up very far, but sooner or later, inevitably, you will make a slip and you will fall. And then all sorts of sinful karmic reactions will begin to accrue. That means one is falling into hell. And then one shifts into the salvation phase. Help! Save me! As he's falling. <laughs> so if he's successful in his salvationism, then he gets a nice soft landing at the bottom. And then he's very humble. Oh, I'm sorry. Then he sees the mountain. <laughs> Actually, I should try this other path. <laughs> and then he tries again. <laughs> so throughout all eternity, climbing, climbing, getting near the top. Oh, the peak is in sight. Oh yeah, there's the flute, there's the peacock feather, the crown, everything there for me. Ah! <laughs> help, help, save me, I'll be good, I'll be good. Oh, oh, I'm so sinful, so fallen. Oh, such a rotten soul of mine. Oh, I'm going to be very good now. I'm just going to worship God. Be his servant. I didn't see that path. <laughs> <laughs> so in this way, and this and this uh, it mentions here, uh, Dharidra Narayan, Swami Narayan, Mitya Narayan. This is probably showing some real humor here. Dharidra Narayan means poor Narayan. This is a policy uh, that has come about in India after this Vivekananda. He because actually he was a, just a, a nationalist, another mundane Hindu nationalist dressed up as a Swami. <clears throat> and he, want, he was using religion, religious sentiment to, uh, to unleash some sort of social program in India. Uh, he was even before Gandhi, Gandhi did that too. So uh, Vivekananda, he invented this phrase, Taridra Narayan, which means uh, Narayan has become the beggar in the street. The Ridra means poor, beggar. So uh, his preaching was that there's no need to go to the temple and make offerings to the deity. You see, you know, just like you have here in front of the deity of Yiskan temple, we have this donation box where people can come and place some money for the deity. But Vivekananda's preaching is uh, what is the use? I'm giving money to Lakshmi Narayan or Dhana Narayan. He's wealthy. He has all the money he needs. He doesn't need your donation. Give it to the poor man in the street. Because according to our Mayavadi philosophy, everybody is God. So God has appeared on the street as a beggar. And he truly deserves your donation. So the Ridra Narayan. And then Swami Narayan. This is a Sudarsan movement called Swami Narayan in Western India, and then some, some man, uh, some sort of preacher who appeared a couple hundred years ago, he's accepted by them. He's an ordinary man, but he's accepted by them as being Narayan, Swami Narayan. And then Mitya Narayan, actually I'm not really sure where that comes from, but Mitya means illusion. So some philosophy of illusory Narayan, but what this all means is, and this is like the uh, last word in frustration of this climbing the mountain, falling off, climbing the mountain, falling off. And now they become so frustrated. Well, I'm not going to climb this mountain. <laughs> I'm just going to declare myself Durindra Narayan. <laughs> At the bottom of the mountain, he's become God. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man, dog in the street. He's Now he's gone. See, by, by decree, by, by some propaganda public decree, <coughs> so, when society becomes so insane, then yeah, someone may be, enjoy, may be able to enjoy this brief life as Narayan, even though he's very poor, miserly, niggardly dressed, complete fool. Uh, society may become so deranged that such a person may be accepted as Narayan. It's a fact. It goes on. It's going on. I could. Anyway, that will take us off the track. But there are, have already been uh, in, in Bengal incarnations of God. I mean, persons who are accepted as incarnations of God by many, many people on the strength of their being poor and wretched. Uh, but 
I don't, I don't get into this. It's a whole thing that takes us off the track. But it's a fact. It's going on. So, uh, but this is like uh, this is like the story of the blue jackal. You see, there was a jackal. And the jackal is despised among all the creatures of the jungle because the jackal just slinks behind the lion. He's a beggar. He slinks behind the lion. The lion kills and eats something and leaves some bones with a little flesh on it. And then the jackal comes and gnaws on the bones. <laughs> you see, he, he won't kill his own food. He's too cowardly. He's too <coughs> the meanings of others. So he's despised by all living entities. So once the jackal was uh, running through the forest, and there was some washerman who had set out, uh, he'd been washing some clothes and he was going to dye them blue. So he had a big vat of blue dye. And the jackal <coughs> running along happened to fall into this vat of dye. So he came out, he was all blue. And so he ran into the forest, he was very bewildered, now I'm all blue. <laughs> oh no, what does this mean? So, but then when he came among the other animals, they saw this blue animal. And then the animals, they, they were being suddenly very respectful. They were paying their obeisance. They were saying, who are you, sir? And the jackal understood. Oh, they don't recognize me anymore. And then he said, I am the supreme. <laughs> and they were all very oh, Then we will put you on a throne and worship you. So everyone, even the lion, even the great lion, the elephant, the great animals of the forest. They were there, they had the jackal on the throne, and they were making a puja, and they were bringing offerings, and he was there with a crown, and he was giving orders, and he was really having a good time. <laughs> and then it just so happened, after a few days, a, uh, a flock, or what is like a herd, a pack, a pack of jackals in the distance. You see, right in the middle of puja, they were doing blue puja, <laughs> Sing the song. The blue jackal is there on the throne. And then in the distance, a pack of jackals started to howl. And you know, these dogish entities, when they hear this howling, then this jackal, he went, Whoa! <laughs> His crown fell off, and all the animals were looking, Wait a minute, it's just a jackal! <laughs> and they tore him to pieces. <laughs> so temporarily, you see, if society becomes so stupid, one can become declared God simply by falling into a bat and blue dye or being able to make ashes come from his hand or something like that. Or just being poor. <laughs> being very poor. So in Kali Yuga society, he may <coughs> be able to enjoy an exalted position for some short time, but then afterwards will be torn to pieces by the Amadudas. <laughs> so this is certainly not receiving the mercy of Krishna. So what does it mean to receive the mercy of Krishna? That is explained in the translation, last sentence by Srila Prabhupada. Only those who hear the vibration of the Vedic mantras can appreciate you. Now, appreciate in Krishna in terms of this verse, he's described here as Ishwar. So, uh, people today in the Kali Yuga, they do not appreciate that they are under control. They do not like to think like that. They do not want to admit that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the uh, demonstration of you under control here. <laughs> so they do not want to admit, they do not like the idea that they are under control, that they are servant, that they have to follow laws. No, everyone is, not everyone, but most people are trying to assert their independence. And there was a, an upstart philosopher who uh, uh, was, he conceived of a philosophy that pro was a kind of protest against control of material nature. Uh, uh, he wanted to, by philosophy, erase uh, 
uh, any idea that the human being is under control of material nature, to speak of God. So one day he was, he was musing over his philosophy and he thought, of all the aspects of nature, the sky gives the most trouble to the human being. Because out of the sky comes uh, rain, torrential rains, comes lightning, comes hurricanes, comes tornadoes, comes snowfall, comes cold weather, comes all sorts of problems come out of the sky. So he was thinking like that, and he was becoming very angry. Oh, this rascal sky! And then he jumped up from his seat, and he began to punch at the sky. He was dancing and hopping. You rascal sky! Take this! Take this! And he was jumping and hopping and leaping, trying to grab at the sky, punch it, kick it. And finally he fell exhausted to the ground. He had sprained his arms and legs. They were all painful. <laughs> he was laying there, puffing for breath. <laughs> and this guy, of course, didn't pay any money to this person. <laughs> this guy remained as it is. With this guy. So, like that, people, today, they protest against any idea that they're under control. And, and, but their protestations are all ridiculous. Uh, very amusing, actually. So, uh, people, you, you all probably have experience, devotees. Uh, the reaction of the, the arrogant, beastly men of today. Uh, why you bow down to idols? And why, why the women sit in the back? And why do they have to be shy and cover their heads? And uh, why you work without any money, getting money, getting paid? And, uh, what about your healthy sex life? So on and so forth. They're uh, accusing the devotees of being slaves. Mm -hmm. But actually, Srila Prabhupada said that is the proper position. <laughs> it's not actually slavery, but Srila Prabhupada gave the nice example of a good son. Uh, the relationship between a father and son is very natural and healthy. Uh, when the father loves the son and the son loves the father, then there is a natural inclination for the father to care for his son by giving good direction, by uh, protecting his son, uh, giving him uh, proper upbringing, and there is a natural <coughs> tendency on the part of the son to be very obedient to his father. <coughs> and Srila Prabhupada said, in this, that this relationship is also very, very enjoyable because they protest. They protest that you have to enjoy life. You Hare Krishnas are not enjoying. You see, you're just acting as slaves. To enjoy, you have to be free, do what you like. But Srila Prabhupada explained that when a father and son have loving, a nice, loving relationship, then when the son wants to enjoy something, Prabhupada gave this example, for instance, the son wants to go to some cinema, some movie, then he will ask his father, my dear father, this film is playing in town, I would like to see it. Um, can we see it? And father will say, yes, let's see it together. So they actually enjoy doing things together. So father will take the son to the movie, will buy him popcorn, will pay for the tickets. Father is there always protecting. But boy, there may be some rowdy kids, as they're often are, standing on the street in front of the theater, and if the boy would come alone, they would beat him up and take his ticket money. But when they see him with father, they stand there. <laughs> So the boy can just walk very confidently with his father and look at these boys. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you see, this is, this is very nice. So Srila Prabhupada explained the devotee of Krishna. He loves Krishna. Krishna loves his devotee. And together they enjoy. The devotee, is, he takes this willing and loving subordinate position. 
because this affords him uh, protection, uh, Krishna's protection. <coughs> Moreover, it affords him uh, a very sweet and intimate relationship with the Lord. He's enjoying so many varieties of exchanges with Krishna. <coughs> Whereas the upstart, he has no relationship with Krishna uh, and he has no protection from the material energy. So, it's a very vain endeavor to try to become the independent enjoyer of this material world. One is simply cut down by material nature. But anyway, the, the materialists are often very persistent. They do not uh, have good sense. They're like the beasts. <coughs> But for those with intelligence, and they can use their brain in such a way to, as I explained in the beginning of the lecture, first of all, understand their own position, what we are, and we are not the body, and we are servant of Krishna. And then, as Shri <coughs> is explaining here, to uh, go on to understand that Krishna, the Supreme Lord, is right there in the heart, and that our relationship with Him is eternal, It is very natural. We are already serving. If we deny to serve Krishna, then we have to serve this material energy, which is a thankless service. We are repaid only in birth, old age, disease, death. Uh, so it is uh, a very simple matter of shifting our service over to the Supreme Lord and becoming liberated from this material existence, going back home, back to God. I'll stop here. Do you hope this name of Krishna, Guru Shokra? He is the only name because he's the only controller, the only enjoyer. Those are the considered the prerogatives of the male, that he's controller and he's enjoyer. And female is controlled and enjoyed. That's the idea. Of course, the reality is completely opposite. <laughs> because this is the world of Maya. So maya is predominant, material energy is but predominant. And uh, the foolish living entities are trying to be purusha. And actually they're prakriti, but they're trying to be purusha. And this is a, 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 a completely, this is hallucinatory endeavor. So they're dreaming that they're being controlled and enjoyed, but they're not. They're being controlled. And they're being enjoyed. So anyway, uh, this statement that we are prakriti is just a statement of our of our tattva, of our our uh, uh, position in reality. It does not necessarily mean that we have a <coughs> spiritual female form, but we are predominated by Krishna. So if we uh, assume our proper position as servants of Krishna. Then, uh, yes, then we may attain a female form or another spiritual form. But in any case, that's our proper position to the servants of Krishna. Yeah? In what way can I tell the soul is pure and unmatched by that? Because the soul is there to supply us 